Hello, welcome back, fellow jazz bounds. It's Felipe here. Thank you so much for joining once again. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever you are. So, as a, after this long overdue hiatus um, on this three part video series that we try to make, uh, today is the final installment. Kind of like the Godfather, after 20 years, we finally wrapped up, had a third installment. Uh, now, without reasons, of course, personal work music reasons, everything. And I wanted to make sure this was going to be uh, an interesting episode as well. I like the very first two parts of uh, Lee Morgan um, series that we had. Um, this was be, it's not going to be so musical. The end of his life is a lot more going on than just music. Uh, we're just going to show and, and talk about three records actually, and talk a lot more about his his personal life, his social life, his political life, and his musical thoughts, which uh, a lot of those are, are quite uh, unexpected, uh, quite interesting to learn. And I think when everything comes together into place, that makes a lot of sense. And that's what we're going to uh, discuss a little bit now. So in the late 60s, what, what's going on? There's a lot going on. Uh, in the country, politically, you have wars. You have um, a recently assassinated president uh, in 63. In 68, you have the assassination of Robert Kennedy. You have the assassination of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, fighting movements, Black Panthers, um, a lot going on. It's a stirring pot, to use a, a, a big cliche. However, uh, it's not isolated. That reflects in art, reflects in music. And uh, Lee Morgan is not immune from it. Plus, you have British invasion that came in 64, 65. Uh, American acts that um, were started kicking in as well. American bands, uh, rock was taking over. It was being this empowering. As a result, <clears throat> the, the clubs, the, 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 the concert houses, they were getting empty. They were just filling out big arenas. A lot of the small venues are closing, the bars, the, the live jazz. Uh, some of them are, are remaining still, like the Birdland, Village Gate, uh, Slugs, right? Which has a very important role in uh, the last moments of um, Lee Morgan's life. But most important, with, with the, um, the rock, the bands, uh, a very important thing comes into place as well. The concept of the album no longer um, jukebox, it's no longer 45s. Everything was about the album, this whole experience. So people are choosing to actually stay home and listen to albums. And that's a uh, um, conclusion, not mine, but actually an interview Michael Kuskuna, the, the, the famous Michael, Kus Michael Kuskuna, actually admits to that. The whole album concept also helped kind of downplay, uh, I wouldn't say kill, but downplay the importance of jazz and live music in general, small acts. So those guys are getting more disconnected to the youth, to like more modern times, uh, everything that was going on in those days. And so Lee Morgan, many other musicians, they start also getting into the political side, getting into jazz, kind of rethinking what, what, what is jazz? What have we been doing so far? How does jazz fit as an art in the history of the country, in the history of music? Where are we? Where do we belong? What does it mean? What we are doing, what does it actually mean? So the private airplay audiences, there's a, a certain, certain like sadness in the late 60s. The musicians are not so, let's say, content. They're not so happy with their work, their art. So. Um, and Lee, particularly, he was uh, working in Mothership, uh, Larry Young's record. He was still uh, fighting addiction. He was still in, in a really bad shape. He gets beaten again. He lost. He loses more teeth. Um, and then he really spoils the session. Things don't go very well. He, he's kind of really in a down moment in his life about 79. So in 67, right before that, he recorded The Sixth Sense. That's the album here, Six Sense. That's that's a blue label. So Six Sense is interesting because it's one of the first records where he kind of takes steps. 
If you look at the liner notes, they're quite lengthy, they're long, they talk about um, this empowerment, this freedom. Uh, and Ed Williams, he says, um, Lee Morgan is today a very mature man who knows where he wants to go and exactly what it takes to get there. In fact, his strong sense of direction might well be the sixth sense. So Lee Morgan assumes himself as being a more mature person, past the Sidewinder um, frenzy, the whole big thing. Um, he starts, even the cover is a little more contemplative uh, kind of thing. Uh, the, his hat, right, has a lot to do with the, the, the sign of the time. It has a lot to do with what's going on. And he starts to be thinking himself as a musician, as a person, as an activist. That's a very important uh, period of his life. So in 69, again, he's got his teeth knocked out. He's really in a, in a down um, moment again. And this is short af shortly after he met uh, this, this lady, this social worker called Helen Moore. She's a social worker, apparently uh, from New York. She gets married, goes to live in North Carolina. Things don't go well. And then she gets back to New York. She is actually 14 years old than uh, Lee. So when they get together, it was it was a perfect combination. They they get along really well. She's seen by Lee and behaves also as this mother figure. She um, she takes care of him. He helps protecting him. She, she she tries to help with the whole addiction problem, and also in the managing side as well. She tries to get him gigs, get him hooked up with good musicians, go to good venues, try to play. So Helen Moore, despite the, the tragic end uh, of Lee's life, she has a very important role. She helps him get himself together at, at, in the late 60s and, um, and sort of propels him to, to, do, to do good again, to do, to do better, uh, right? So right after, he goes play the, the famous Lighthouse concerts when he puts together in 1970 a great quintet with B Benny Maupin, Jimmy Merritt, Harold Mayburn, and Mickey Rocky on drums. Mickey Rocky, an excellent, excellent drummer. They toured, they played a few gigs, and they, they have one of their, their highlights at the Lighthouse. Beautiful, beautiful session at the Lighthouse uh, Beach in California. At Hermosa Beach, sorry, and the Lighthouse Club. Uh, Mickey Rocker, he was this drummer. He was on fire. He was a really good drummer. Uh, Lee felt the, the quintet was doing really good. He felt like Mickey, he was the, the base, the foundation. However, a lot of people wanted him. So after he gets a call from Dizzy Gillespie, uh, yes, he, he goes to Dizzy Band, which uh, despite being sort of uh, sponsor and, and trained and taught by Dizzy uh, early in his career, Lee Morgan takes it really, really deep. He, he really did, didn't, didn't like it. So next comes Billy Harper. Billy Harper joins the band. And in 1969, he starts being very active in, in, in the movement. Uh, mainly Lee and some other musicians, uh, they start working more actively, especially in, in media. They actually uh, invade the Merv Griffin show. They invade uh, Johnny Carlson's show, demanding more, more space for black musicians, not only as a, as a backup band at the end of the stage who doesn't say or mean or anything, but they actually carry the whole thing along. So many associations start forming, like the Chicago Association for Advancement of Creative Musicians, the UGMA, the BAG. Um, there's um, the sense of getting together, uniting. Most of the, the musicians, they were unemployed. They didn't have uh, good contracts. They actually vouch to, to get together as almost like a union to negotiate contracts, to not, um, you know, to sort of demand certain standards, certain uh, salaries, some uh, wages, uh, but things don't don't work uh, very well. When Archie Shep signs with Impulse, kind of behind the whole movement, people don't get very happy about it. But that that's what happened. That's what happens. And but they still uh, this movement uh, breaks down. But then there's also the CBA, the Collective Black Artists. They 
I really, really uh, believe that the individual has to be subservient to the individual cause. They, they, they invest a lot in teaching, in education, um, and, and also on the salary. They think that they're getting a lot less than what they deserve. So the Just People's Movement, they start working in communities. They start this outreach uh, to get more space for them in media, in TV, in shows, in radio. And um, it's not individualism, but it's more like a work in security. They want to make sure they have work. They have um, recognition. They, they want to make sure that they, they're going to be recognized and shape and protect music. That's ultimately what they want. And, and interestingly, um, the, another movement, the Black Artist Movement, they are out there to try to make sure that um, jazz is seen as, according to, Don, to, to Bird, Donald Bird, as a Black cultural achievement. Um, you know, this, um, this landmark of American culture, American history, the, the true American art form. Uh, and they believe truly that jazz as an art, their musicians, they should have endowments. They should be protected. They should have uh, funds guaranteed. They should be subsidized, just like they have patrons. Just like um, they actually say, you know, classical music, uh, Bernstein, they have patrons. They have memberships. They, they're subsidized, you know, and, and jazz, which is a real non-white American music expression, music art, probably the most iconic of all. Why not? So what, what's the point? So, and they want just to be sort of institutionalized, just to be recognized as an American tradition, as an American uh, landmark that needs to be funded, that needs to be taken care of because it cannot be lost. So according to Jack McLean, they want to see no more geniuses going to waste, like Charlie Parker. Jazz is the only true form of art that this country has ever produced. Uh, make sure that the young musicians are paid. This is a word of Jack McLean. Uh, just like the European um, uh, classical music, those guys should, should be endowed. They should have like almost like shrines built into them. So in 1970, they actually pro try to proclaim jazz as a black national classical music. And but at the same time, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think that the war jazz, it, it was, it was, a, it was an, uh, like inner fight in, in, in the, the community, the musicians, especially the black ones, because jazz, uh, they want to even like repeal the word jazz. Jazz is a word that came from the late 20s, early 30s as a slang, a sexual uh, slang against black people as a way to portray them as objects. Uh, but also at the same time, when it comes to the late 60s, to see the achievement, the, the, the highs that jazz has achieved, especially in the 40s, 50s, early 60s, they find actually this is a reason to celebrate. They were able to overcome this prejudice, overcome these labels, and then um, really establish jazz as a true art form. Jazz was being left for dead as his own culture, so it's important to celebrate, to remember it. Um, so celebrate the music and nothing else. As in, uh, try to, to bring to, 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 to the young people, uh, take elements of everything that's going on around them to, um, to integrate into jazz and make jazz more accessible as well. The music, musicians, they recognize that times are changing, there's other styles of music. Uh, people are enjoying music in different ways. So it's important for jazz also not to stay in the past, but to keep up what's going on and use that as a platform, a springboard to fuse everything together, to, to capture this whole social moment, this whole cultural moment, going back to the really roots of, of black culture and, and put everything together into jazz. That's why I, I found it quite interesting, late 60s, how different the records sound, this post-hard bop, this free jazz area, um, 
although it's not the, the traditional uh, form of jazz, scheme of jazz, it's quite remarkable to see that the musicians, they were actually going back to the roots. Think about the origins of the black culture, the churches, the funk, the R&B. Um, jazz comes from there. Jazz does not exist on its own. So it's important to, to see that, look back and bring those elements into music and be more open, expansive. That's, that's a really good point that many musicians were, were looking uh, back in those days, especially Lee Morgan, among all the other uh, free jazz in the late 60s. Right. So soon uh, Lee Morgan, he, he transitions into actually teaching. Uh, he, he hooks up with the um, with the Harlem Youth Opp um, um, Opportunities Unlimited. Right. So which is um, a movement that was funded uh, by the federal government through the Anti-Poverty Agency. So this uh, Harry U uh, Act which Harry stands for, of course, for Harlem Youth uh, Opportunity Unlimited. It was actually found by two psychologists, Kennedy Clark and Mary Phillips, Phipps Clark in 62, and uh, their first manager, director of Cyril deGrasse Tyson, uh, yeah, actually, actually the father of Neil deGrasse Tyson, as, as we know. So this uh, initiative was funding uh, work, arts, uh, helping uh, the community of Harlem, helping with all fundings for all this type of activities. So Lee Morgan, uh, he kind of enrolls in teaching. He goes teaching uh, young people because he truly believes that uh, jazz is being lost by, by the youth as an art form. He wasn't even recognized anymore by some of the young folks that are already playing trumpet. They didn't know who he was. So he, he finds it quite important to engage in the community, he would teach um, along along with other musicians as well. So, for example, uh, Joe Newman, Freddie Waits, Billy Mitchell, uh, Sonny Red, and when um, Lee Morgan uh, was not able to teach, Kenny Dorham would fill in for him <laughs> as, a, as a as a as a teacher. But and Lee, uh, different from like guy like Joe Newman, for example. He was not trying to, to, to tell them to play sheet music or uh, more traditional ways, conventional. He wanted to teach those kids off the bat to improvise, to learn, to feel and jazz, right? Interpretation, improvisation, that's, that's it. So Lee Morgan would say, learn changes, <clears throat> uh, emphasis on the blues, because the blues is the base of all music. So for Lee Morgan, he knew for sure, as Herbie and others from his time, he they grew up listening to uh, rhythm and blues. They knew that the blues was the base of every single type of music. So that's uh, what he he wanted there. And Billy Harper, uh, when he was playing with a band, Billy Harper would describe uh, Lee Morgan as like this big brother. So Lee Morgan was kind of shaping his band the way um, Art Blakey, uh, portrayed such an important role in his own band. So Lee wanted to um, to make sure that he would get new people in the band and he would be able to guide them, uh, give them a confidence, give them the power to become better musicians and perhaps stay with him or just uh, have their own paths. So in his... Uh, Last three and a half years, uh, he would record um, other songs, only songs from different uh, from other um, composers. In the last three and a half years of his life, Lee would never, ever again record his own compositions. He found, I think, it was very generous, but also a kind of selfish thing. What he was trying to achieve is giving these guys this freedom to to do this, but at the same time learn from them, kind of. Uh, learn new approaches, learn new uh, techniques from by letting his musicians, his band do their own thing. That's what that's his main idea was. So and and he starts embracing this more uh, free advanced, although he was not a modal guy, he never liked modal. He tried with very uh, questionable uh, results. Lee Morgan was never into modal. 
but uh, he truly believed in improvisation and grabbing everything that was around him and using his uh, Miles style. So he, he would say, uh, th look at uh, the Fillmore, look at um, um, Jack Johnson. So it's a, it's a different background, every record. It's a different ensemble. Miles knew how to pick those guys to achieve a certain uh, goal. But if you remove everybody else, it's always Miles. So that's... Uh, that's what Lee Morgan believed in changing the context, not changing the person, which I, 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 I thought was quite interesting. Uh, he, he really admired the hipness of Miles. Uh, and at some point, he was, he even said that he was trying to, to, to be like Pharaoh and just do whatever. Right? So Lee Morgan was really into this exploration, he was very into this freedom. So 17 and 18 of September of 71, he records his last studio album, his last date. Lee Morgan. Simply titled Lee Morgan. This is uh, this record is, has different names. I think some other people call Lee Morgan 4. There's a uh, last session, whatever. But it is simply Lee Morgan, right? Uh, this is a Division United when it came out. Uh, with his last quintet, what I just mentioned. And the cover itself looks more like a departure, right? Uh, there's only five songs in here. Um, two by Billy Harper and the other three songs by the rest of the, um, the band. Uh, ben, uh, Benny, Jimmy, and Freddie. So what this record means is that he was trying to achieve a more album centric. He didn't care too much about making those jukebox songs, making short hits. He wanted to make a full concept as the market was dictating or the, uh, the time. That's how it was. Albums, albums. He wanted to make albums, long songs, use as much as he could on each side, explore the musicians. And that's what's his main idea. That was his main idea. So, and then he starts doing some more activist uh, work as well. In 72, he plays some gigs, uh, some concerts um, for supporting Angela Davis, that activist that was arrested uh, in 72 after some protests in California. Uh, a person dies, um, and um, the assassin was using a gun of her, so she gets... Uh, she gets... Um, accused of uh, being being a killer with not just because it was her uh, her her gun she she goes through a lot of suffering and uh, there was a, a huge revolt in the community uh, about her uh, about the, the way she was being treated the way things are being held so the and, and others uh, or silver and, and other um, musicians they start playing concerts to support her then um by those times uh wrapping up as i said it was not going to be too much about uh, his musical career although i think this has every to do everything to do with the music uh in 72 um he was starting to feel a little bit he was starting to feel really confident about himself i think the music aspect made him feel very very com very comfortable he was playing with, with a great band So he, he was start seeing other people. He was started getting really an interest in, in, Angel, in uh, Helen. Think about Helen was um, 14 years older. She was also, because she was helping him, because she, she was really important, assumed this mother figure, she was trying to dictate um, what his next career moves should be, where to play, what kind of stuff to play, to be more uh, politically involved which is something that he didn't want to be like playing gigs to support parties or anything. He just played those gigs for Angela Davis because he felt the suffering. He felt there was like a spiritual connection. So he said, no, I, I don't want that. He starts seeing uh, other girls hooking up. And um, then he, at the very end of his life, he, he was playing uh, concerts here and there. The band was doing, they were scheduled to go to Europe. Uh, and then there's uh, infamous night at uh, the Slugs, right? The, the nightclub, that very snowy day. 
I won't get too much into that because I think that kind of it's not uh, the purpose. But uh, I mean, his relationship with Helen was very fragile. Um, I think on both sides. I mean, she was being possessive, but he was hitting her. Um, you know, so there was a very, very hard relationship there. So turns out in that week, uh, and the, the, the Friday concert on Monday, there was a Valentine's Day concert. He plays, um, she, she is in the audience. They don't have, uh, they have fights. Uh, so during the whole week, he, he was already, um, he was with another girl that he met. Um, he was like and doing, re doing really silly st things like going to, to arcades and, you know, getting drunk on the streets. So on Friday, he gets in his car. They, they, they're heading to the, to the, to the Celeste to play the gig. He uh, had a fight with Helen early in the day. Um, it's really, really snowing, really hard. The, the, um, there's a car wreck. Then he, they, they're okay, so but they just keep walking, go to the club. And then at that point, he doesn't feel, um, he doesn't feel very well. He gets into the, um, the dressing room, the bathroom, just stays there and just comes back when, when it's time to play. The band plays, um, and apparently Heron uh, shows up at the door. Uh, they go there, they argue uh, about some keys that uh, she apparently changed the locks of the apartment. So he goes um, asking for the keys. They had a fight. He takes the keys off his purse. She goes and then she comes back. When she comes back, uh, she's got his gun. They say, I, I got your, I have your, your gun, I have your gun. And says, oh, I better got the bullets and you no, know, lots of discussion here and there. And uh, all they hear is, is the bop, the, the, the shot. Um, um, so Lee falls, bleeding. He dies of hemorrhage because there was no way uh, an ambulance could get, get there on time. And it took him like a couple of hours to, to get to the hospital. But at that time, he was already declared dead. Uh, one thing I think is interesting is, um, according to the scripts of one of the musicians, uh, his eyes were eye wide open, but there was no life. And she was hysterical. Um, so, and also he, he had been paid in advance. He was full of money in his pockets, but by the, by the time he was declared dead in the hospital, there was no money to be found. Nobody knows what, what happens to, to the money he was carrying in his pocket. Uh, regarding this episode, his last, uh, his relationship with Helen in general and a little bit of his biography, uh, there's a, a, a great uh, movie biography based on those tapes that uh, she recorded. It's a fascinating story. Just, just the, getting the tapes and her uh, confession is quite a story. So whoever has not watched, uh, they call him Morgan. It's a great, great movie. It's a, it's a beautifully done. Um, there's passages with voices. It's mostly like a, a, she, she's it's like being heard, right? She's just like recording on a tape, talking to an interviewer. And uh, reenacting the, this moment is is very is very sad, but it's is really really well done. And I think in terms of learning a little bit of Lee's uh, final days and his last uh, words, some of his best moments as well, I, I, I think it's quite fascinating. It's a movie that everybody should work should should read, and um, and that's it. I think uh, everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed. I hope everybody uh, learned something as I learned so much. Um, and again, I couldn't do anything. Uh, I'm not saying that I, of course, nothing comes from the top of my head. So I was highly based on this book here, Lee Morgan, His Life, Music, and Others by Tom Perchard. It's a fantastic read and it's almost like an academic work, um, full of references, it's really, really well based. Uh, it's a great book. It's not an easy book to read in a sense that demands your attention. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of background. It's not only about storytelling, uh, you know. It, it's, it's a great, it's a great, great uh, book. I highly recommend. And those records here, we don't see them all the time being played, being acknowledged as the early Blue Notes. But um, they're great. They are great. I don't, I didn't buy the box, just those two, the, the original double of the lighthouse. Uh, 
I think you, they were showing the direction he was going. They show, uh, I think, in, in a sense, the, the, the genius of his musicianship, not because of what he did with Art Blakey, not his solo career, um, nothing. I think this shows his genius because he was learning how to adapt. He was learning how to, to move forward, to embrace his whole culture and to make something out of it. And I think um, that, that, was, that was his brilliance. That was the brilliance, which unfortunately uh, was cut short very early in his life. Maybe that's what's the way it's supposed to be. I don't know. But I think uh, lastly, he comes. We have an amazing body of work, but he's an amazing musician who died early, as many others, not of cancer or addiction, uh, as we would expect, unfortunately, very unfortunately. Um, but he left this immense, huge, beautiful body of work that should be ke kept passing, passing, passing on, passing on. And um, that's it. Lee Morgan, Lee Morgan, genius, genius, genius. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to hit a uh, subscribe. Uh, follow us. Uh, we've been having great discussions on our streams, on our videos. I hope everybody enjoyed and see you next time.